Hi, today we're going to be talking about a few do's and don'ts when undertaking your journey to the U.S. So whenever you're starting your immigration process, please keep in mind these things that you should be doing and not doing. So first, do plan ahead do understand just how long the immigration process will take, which, depending on what visa you're applying for, can go from anywhere uh, a couple of months to several years, or in the case of some petitions, even a decade or more. So understand what you're applying for and plan ahead. On the other hand, you shouldn't be depending on these plans working out exactly as you've chalked them. Um, there are many different ways, both specific to your profile and otherwise, that the processing of your petition or application could be delayed or even denied. There are several different ways in which these delays can occur that we've seen over the last four or five years with internal adjustments of policy, internal holds, immigration bans, specific immigration classes being frozen. We've seen travel bans in association with, uh, with public health or some other criterion. There are many different reasons that not relating to your profile at all could delay your, your application. Beyond this, there could be some sort of internal red flag or an incompleteness in your in your application or petition that could trigger a additional administrative processing period or a request for more information, which will, in essence, freeze the the processing of your application in the pipeline, and you could end up having to wait for a much, much longer time. These can extend for several months and even even for for several years. Uh, if you recall, from March 2020 to March 2021, there was a freeze, a, a complete class-wide freeze on the grant of visas in the H-1B category. And even after that, there have been significant delays. There have been an additional level of administrative processing. So while you should be planning ahead in order to accommodate the requirements of the visa as soon as it's granted, you should not be bound to these plans. You should be flexible in, in your approach as long as you're in this immigration process. In essence, make plans, but hold on to them with a soft grip. Second, do make sure that the visa category that you've applied for is the right category. Now, there are several different types of visa that you can apply for. As we've discussed before on this channel in brief, there are visitors visas, there are non-immigrant visas that are for work purposes, there are non-immigrant visas that are for study purposes, there are other non-immigrant visas that are for familial purposes or for the purposes of some sort of exhibition, exchange program, uh, etc. There are also immigrant visas that can be on the basis of employment, on the basis of some sort of extraordinary ability, on the basis of family, refugee cases, and many, many others. And the criterion for each type of visa and the rights that are associated with it are very, very different. So to make sure that you are maximizing your chances of success, make sure that you go in for the right class of visa for you. Hand in hand with choosing the right class of visa is to not make parallel applications for visas that have conflicting intents or that just don't work together. So oftentimes because the requirements of these visas are very different, the things that you need to demonstrate are very different. So if you're going on a visitor's visa, for example, you have to demonstrate that you have no intention to reside in the U.S. However, if you are going on a H-1B visa, which is there for immigrants that are looking to stay temporarily in the U.S. to, to work, 
then you have to demonstrate that you plan to move to the U.S. in order to fulfill the requirements of your employment. And so applying for both of these visas at the same time will require you to say to the USCIS both that you intend to return quickly and not work and that you intend to work and not return. And in these cases, the very fact of the second visa application will doom both applications. So there are some applications that can occur simultaneously. Uh, for example, a K-class visa for a fiancé can also be processed side by side with a tourist visa or a uh, familial visa. But it's important that if you're making parallel applications, that the intent and the purpose and most importantly, what you are saying to the USCIS does not conflict. And because of this reason, it's often the easiest course not to make parallel applications, to apply for the one visa that you have selected that you have the best chance of obtaining. Now, it's important when you are applying for your visa to prepare a record. Now, this means to assemble all of the documents that will demonstrate your case to the USCIS that this visa is one that you are eligible for and should be granted to you. Now, Generally, what happens in the process is you are given an application form to fill out, but what's left unstated is that you need to attach many, many different documents in order to demonstrate the veracity of everything that you've claimed in the, in the application. So it's important that you put together all of the documentation that's going to prove that your facts that that everything that you stated in the application is true on the one hand and beyond that that you meet the eligibility criterion now given the importance of this record the fact that this is in essence the only way that you can prove your eligibility on all grounds whether it is your record your identity your employment your financial stability your relationship with any sponsors, and so on, uh, oftentimes when you're putting together the record, you will find that there are some areas that that you just can't demonstrate, that you don't have the documents for. Uh, this can be a systemic issue. This can be the loss or destruction of documents. This can be certain certain factors that aren't documented very well. And it's important in these cases for you not to, to create or to manufacture or even retroactively have executed documents that, that demonstrate your, your case. So, for example, if you are showing that you own a certain piece of property, but that property wasn't transferred through anything more than a handshake agreement or just simply the changing of, uh, of names in, in certain informal documents, then you don't really have documentation to prove that property. And it can be tempting to retroactively have a sale or transfer agreement that demonstrates that, that you have owned the property since, you know, whenever you received it. Uh, or take another example. In India, for those that are above a certain, a certain age, it's very unlikely that there will be there will be written birth certificates because many of those records were kept informally and proof of birth was actually uh, demonstrated by school records. So for a lot of applicants that are seeking to go to the U.S., they may not have a birth certificate to demonstrate their identity and, you know, their age. And again, it can be tempting to try to try to obtain a birth certificate where one doesn't exist. And this is a thin line. There's there's a thin line between collecting documentation and creating the existence of documentation. And it is very important to make sure that you are on the right line of this. And for that, if for nothing else, for the assembly of the record and for making sure that you're not crossing into 
into the da dangerous territory of creating documentation, which can end up leading you into a immigration ban due to fraud, it's really important that you seek legal advice. Now, one thing that it's important to do is to avoid unnecessarily changing the facts that you have stated in your petition or your application. Now, when you file them, that's not the end. It doesn't mean that you stated it and it's true at that time, so you're good. When you give a petition or an application for processing, these are continuing statements. Now, what that means is, as long as they hold the petition or the application, you are considered to continuously be affirming that they're true. So if you provide the application on a Monday and they're processing it up until Friday, it is considered that you have stated continuously from Monday until Friday that everything in that statement is true. And that liability can, can extend on uh, throughout the process and maybe even after the process. So it's important that you minimize the changes in the facts. So if you've given contact information, as far as possible, keep that contact information. If you've stated the ownership of assets, as far as possible, maintain ownership of those assets. If you have declared a certain relationship, as far as possible, maintain that relationship. Keep things as stable as possible through the application process because any change is going to lead to a gap in the in the continuing statement and you are going to need to rectify that and if there's too many changes or if the changes are too broad it can actually delay your application while the amendment or addendum is being processed Now, hand in hand with what we just discussed, it's important that you don't conceal, you don't delay reporting any changes. So if there are changes that are made, the temptation could be to, to slow play it, to see if it really becomes relevant and to just let the application continue processing because you don't want to introduce any delays. But because they're continuing declarations, the, the difference between what they have on the paper and your current reality, if they examine it at any time, will likely be considered fraud if you don't rectify it as soon as possible. And fraud in an immigration application can lead to a immigration ban altogether. It will most likely result in the termination of your application and will oftentimes result in either a five-year ban on any type of travel or a 10-year ban on any type of travel uh, to the US. So it's important that while you are maintaining as few changes as possible, you don't make any delay in notifying the USCIS of the changes as they occur. Most importantly, do keep your nose clean. That means avoid any legal trouble, any disciplinary action, uh, really, really anything that may look like a negative indictment on your character, because oftentimes, if there is a civil lawsuit, if there is a a criminal charge, if there is some some sort of disciplinary action that can call your application into question, uh, th these will often just just result in a straightforward. Uh, rejection of your application or petition. There, there are several different types of trouble where if you get into them, even if ultimately you, you're able to, you know, defeat the charges, win the case, X, Y, and Z, uh, get out of trouble. The fact that you were in that, that, that you had that situation is going to make you look like a risk factor. And in many cases, that's going to be enough for them to, you know, simply rubbish your application altogether. So as far as possible, again, you know, you need to keep your nose clean. You need to stay out of legal trouble. You need to avoid any disputes that can result in a, in a lawsuit. You need to avoid disciplinary action. However, just like with the, the changes aspect that we discussed earlier, 
you don't want to conceal any trouble. Because while it is likely that getting into certain types of legal or disciplinary trouble can lead to the rejection of your application, concealing any facts can result in not only the, the rejection of the application, but a, a complete ban, a, a complete bar on your admissibility. So even if, if you end up in a situation where you're in trouble and you're not able to, you know, not, not able to avoid it, not able to, uh, you know, get out of it, it is important that you report the facts to the USCIS in order to, if not your application, at least preserve your ability to apply in the future. So these were just a couple of things that you should be keeping in mind while applying for really any type of visa to the US. Uh, there are several other more specific things that you should be considered depending on the type of visa that you're applying for and your own specific circumstances. So this should in no way be considered a substitute for legal advice. And we would advise that you you seek a immigration attorney to figure out exactly what additional factors you should be thinking about in line with your current application. But in general, when you're approaching the process, these are a few things that that you should be thinking about. Thank you for watching. If you like this video, please like, uh, comment with your thoughts, share it with uh, friends and family, and subscribe to see more content.